What's that? Another installment of pro wrestling wackiness on the road? Well, come on, you surely understood there was enough ammunition out there to produce more content on the subject, and that is appropriate because some of the stories ahead do contain ammunition. After all, what would a tribute to the travels of unruly wrestlers be without elements that make a rational person stare ahead in abject, bug-eyed terror? Through the years here at Cultaholic, we've provided you, the curious viewer, with many tales of professional wrestlers as they navigate any endless roads, sleepless nights and days, smart Alex civilians, and their own personal appetites for destruction. The following video will follow in those same footsteps, as it's got stories of unnecessary danger, unenviable predicaments, and one in a million occurrences that will make one pine for a mundane desk job in a humdrum quiet town. Some stories will induce laughter, others will make you shake your head, and some will have you stringing together various combinations of obscenities. Just remind yourself that the people involved here are in fact professionals. That's the frightening part. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are 10 ridiculous road stories that defy reality. Join us. Number 10, Driven to Kill. In the mid 70s, a college aged Jim Ross was just getting into the business. The acclaimed announcer of Future Days ventured into Mid South Wrestling, where he was given a unique job. He was made assistant to territory owner Leroy McGurk, who had been rendered blind following a car accident years earlier. Ross was responsible for running errands for McGurk and transporting him to and from work. And while tending to McGurk made for some interesting times, one in particular stands out above the rest. One day, JR left for Shreveport with McGurk when McGurk showed him something interesting in his personal bag, a 44 Magnum. A whiskey-fueled McGurk announced to his protege that he was going to kill young Ted DiBiase that night because DiBiase was dating McGurk's daughter, a major no-no in the promoter's eyes. Not only that, but McGurk needed Ross to be his accomplice, setting up DiBiase to unwittingly walk into McGurk's firing line at the motel he'd been staying at. Calm but internally panicked, Ross eventually managed to covert called Booker Bill Watts from a payphone and told him the disturbing master plan. Watts instructed Ross to get the increasingly soused McGurk to the room and get him to bed, and Watts would be there to oversee McGurk from there. And with that, a simple solution ended what could have been a senseless homicide. Number 9. Just hold on, man. The pro wrestling life can be filled with countless hours of weary travel and it's no surprise that the grappler on the go could wind up with thinning patience. Take the case of young Chris Jericho, who occasionally wrestled in Mexico's CMLL promotion in the early 90s. In this instance, Jericho had a flight to catch for a show in Acapulco and arrived a little late to the airport for his liking. No problem though, he still had time to catch his flight. All he had to do was get through the security checkpoints. However, for reasons unclear, the presiding guard insisted on checking every every content of his bag, asking Jericho what each item was in a way that Jericho believed was being done just to screw with him. Fearful that he'd miss his flight, Jericho began acting out and was immediately surrounded by a larger, more hostile security force. But Jericho was about to have backup in the form of Haku, who was also working the Acapulco show. Haku stormed into the fracard, knocked back a pair of guards and even lifted another by his jacket. But once security drew their guns, the game was over and the two were marched to an empty room where they were held for an hour. Fortunately, once the airport manager spoke to them, the pair were able to talk their way out of the situation and were allowed to leave. Number 8. Swamp Trap If ever a pro wrestler deserved a biopic, it's Rowdy Roddy Piper. Throughout his life before, during and after wrestling, the Hot Rod found himself in some pretty wild situations that deserve to be immortalized on film. Just as one example, around 1983, when Piper was becoming a red-hot commodity in mid-Atlantic wrestling, Wrestling, the rowdy one made some appearances down in Florida. On the trip, Piper told some of the boys that he really wanted to see an alligator. And wouldn't you know it, Piper was going to get his wish. Referee Bill Alfonso recalls traveling with Piper, Kevin Sullivan, and Frank Dusick when they spotted a gator near a creek. Piper said he wished he had a gun, to which Dusick simply handed him his. According to Alfonso, Piper managed to plug the gator from a great distance with one shot, causing the animal to tumble into the creek. Piper and Sullivan then went to retrieve the expired gator and stripped down to their undies before heading to the watering hole. As Sullivan tried to distract the other nearby gators, Piper went after his gator, only for the creature to suddenly come to life, maybe he was just selling, and make a move towards young Roddy. 
Piper and Sullivan then hightailed it back to the car, deciding that some impromptu gator barbecue just wasn't worth the trouble. Number 7. Varsity Blaze So, that's three stories in a row in which a firearm was produced. Time to step away from the gunplay for a moment and talk about a more wholesome story, albeit one with a high level of stress. In any era, Varsity Club members Dr. Death Steve Williams and Rick Steiner were two dudes that you did not want to mess with. Double tough with the ability to twist somebody into a pretzel, Williams and Steiner were as rough and tumble as it gets. And should you ever question that, consider the story ahead. It was in Alexandria, Louisiana that Williams and Shatner were in transit to another card when they happened upon an incredible sight, a flaming car wreck with the driver and passengers still trapped inside. A crowd of folks were on hand at the accident site but couldn't figure out how to get the motorists out of the vehicle and they were in great danger of being burned alive. Fortunately for those folks, Williams and Steiner arrived on the scene, rushed the vehicle and collectively ripped one of the doors off, freeing the horde. Everybody managed to get to safety just before the car blew up. Professional wrestling attracts lots of tough guys, but it takes a special kind of guts to do what Williams and Steiner did for those people on that day. Number 6. Blurred Lines One of the more famous instances of wrestlers getting arrested occurred in the spring of 1987, when two on-screen nemeses were busted on the New Jersey Turnpike, Hacksaw Jim Duggan and the Iron Sheik. The two were scheduled to be on the opposite sides of a tag team bout that night in Asbury Park and were en route to the card when a state trooper pulled the wrestlers over. Not only were there containers of alcohol in the vehicle, but Duggan, the driver, admitted to having marijuana stashed beneath the driver's seat. Sheik, meanwhile, had cocaine among his personal effects. The two went on to wrestle that night without informing their superiors, thinking that maybe the incident would be quickly forgotten. Not so, though, as it ended up making the news and in the fallout, Vince McMahon immediately fired both Duggan and Sheik. While the drug and alcohol component to the story was enough of a PR black eye, what made it a bigger scoop for news outlets was the fact that two sworn enemies in kayfabe, pro-USA Duggan and America-hating Sheik, were apparently caught sharing drugs and brewskis on the highway. McMahon instituted a drug policy for cocaine in the wake of this public embarrassment while lecturing the wrestlers on the need to maintain kayfabe. You be the judge of which was more important in the company's eyes. Number 5. He's No Angel In the pantheon of pro wrestling's all-time baddest badasses, there aren't many that hold a candle to the eight-time heavyweight champion of the world, Harley Race. Testimonials from Race's many peers drip with respect and admiration, and perhaps even a little bit of fear. Andre the Giant is said to have only feared two other wrestlers, Haku and Race. And since Haku is functionally the T-1000 with an afro, that should tell you how renowned Race is as a tough guy. This is the story of somebody who learned that fact the hard way. While wrestling one night in Eugene, Oregon, top villain Race was heckled by a group of Hell's Angels in the crowd, and they were looking for a fight. After the card ended, the bikers remained at the venue, waiting for Handsome Harley to reappear. Race answered the call and picked out the biggest member of the bunch. As the story goes, the biker lunged at Race, who proceeded to jut his own head out, smashing the Hell's Angel full force in the nose with his cranium. With blood gushing from the man's nostrils, Race spun him around, snared him into a crude sleeper hold, and let the others watch their friend pass out while a river of blood poured from his face. As the accounts indicate, the other Hell's Angels thought that Race had killed the guy. Needless to say, nobody else wanted to try their luck against the wrestling greats. Number 4. Heat with the Boys For the sake of variety, we like to work in a less harrowing story into these videos, because they do serve to cleanse the palate from the violence and near death you've been hearing about up to this point. This little tale involves the King of the Rib himself, Owen Hart. Owen's peers have shared many a story about the King of Hearts and his predilection for pranking others. The victim in this story is an unnamed hitchhiker, which sounds like the beginning of a horror movie, but fear not, nobody really gets harmed here. As Bob Holly remembers, he, Owen, and Hakushi were traveling together in the new generation days. It was summertime, so it was quite warm outside when Owen spotted the hitchhiker. After turning off the AC and rolling up the windows, Owen picked the guy up and he sat in the back next to Hakushi. Eventually, the guest passenger began complaining about the excessive heat, to which Owen explained that they didn't use air conditioning for some sort of religious reason, so the hitchhiker was out of luck on that front. The poor guy sweated his ass off in the back seat on the long drive to the arena, and while the wrestlers were probably at least mildly uncomfortable with the circumstances, they probably handled it a little better than the hitchhiker did. By the time they reached the venue, Mr. Hitchhiker probably looked like Shane McMahon after 45 seconds of physical exertion. Number 3. Hot Ticket Speaking of Bob Holly and driving, we go from 
from that overheated car saga to one of heat over a car. In 2004, grizzled veteran Holly was traveling with the much younger Rene Dupree, since they were working house shows together. That September, Holly had to fly home to tend to some business, and Dupree apparently asked if Holly would leave the rental car with him. Holly agreed and went off to take care of matters at home. So far, sounds innocent enough, right? Until there was a warrant for Holly's arrest, that is. While on the road, Holly had his mail forwarded to his mother's house. Two months after giving Dupree the rental, Holly received a call from his mum saying that there was a district court notice from Spokane, Washington, informing Holly that his license was suspended for an unpaid parking ticket, and there was also a warrant for his arrest. Apparently, Dupree got the ticket, disregarded it, and since the rental was in Holly's name, he was legally on the hook for it. Understandably furious, Holly confronted Dupree, who denied everything. Holly had to fly to Spokane to straighten it all out, which he's made clear was not cheap to do. As for Dupree, Holly got his revenge at a house show in Syracuse that November, when he completely shot on Dupree, pummeling him so badly that Renee ran backstage mid-match. Holly followed him and continued the beating before Big Show and Agent Fit Finley intervened. Number two, off the rails. Parking tickets, turning off the aircon, all of this is mere child's play to a brush with near death. The Hardy Boys have had their fair share of death-defying exploits through the decades, but this is probably among the closest dates with fate that the Broken Brethren have had. Sometime around the Attitude Era, both Hardys were driving with the headbangers from Chicago to Milwaukee, with Matt situated behind the wheel. They were going fast, as was the car ahead of them, which was driven by the world's strongest driver, Mark Henry. By Matt's recollection, Henry must have been going about 90 miles an hour, and Hardy was well keeping pace with him. Suddenly, as the boys approached the city of Beers, they hit standstill traffic, causing Henry to slam the brakes. Hardy followed in kind, but he was too close to Henry's car, so he tried pulling off the road. Henry was having the same problem with the car ahead of him, so he pulled off too, spurring Hardy to take an even wider angle to avoid an accident. It ended up with Hardy somehow hitting a metal retaining barrier near an exit ramp, and and the non-stopping car wound up riding on top of the rail. With the headbangers panicking and Jeff oddly calm, Matt managed to navigate the rail on just two wheels for 100 heart-stopping feet before he finally managed to safely pull off of it. Pretty sure this was the real inspiration for WWE Crush Hour. Number one, Collision in Korea. What else is there to say about this one? No fancy schmancy title is required, and frankly, we ourselves are amazed that it took us till the fourth installment of Crazy Wrestling Road Stories before this one came up. In 1995, Antonio Inoki was the driving force behind a historic two-night wrestling event in Pyongyang, North Korea, that would take place before crowds of over 150,000 people on each night. Starts from New Japan and WCW filled out the events, with the first and only ever match pitting Anoki against Ric Flair headlining the second night. In the years since, stories about the harrowing trip have emerged, and a 2021 Dark Side of the Ring episode delivered much of the insanity in one handy package. Where to begin? How about the antiquated airplane that brought the wrestlers into North Korea? Or the fact that Too Cold Scorpio and Road Warrior Hawk had a beef that nearly led to Scorpio trying to kill Hawk? Or the wrestlers being followed by Dershays wherever they went, or Scott Norton being brought before armed guards after he'd badmouthed the country in a phone call to his wife. The fact that the fans at 1st of May Stadium had little understanding of what pro wrestling was was one of the less crazy aspects of this trip. Thankfully, it marked the last time professional wrestlers were faced with intense peril while being hosted at an international stadium show. <clears throat>